Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our virtual connect series. This week's topic is marketing in the time of coronavirus. And we are very thrilled today to have not just one, but four experts uh, who know all about marketing, communications, public relations, uh, strategic messaging, uh, you name it, they've got it covered. And it's going to be well worth the price of admission today to get access to these four experts. Uh, you'll get one learning unit if you're a member of AIA for attending today's session. And we also encourage discussion. So there's a Q&A function in your Zoom bar. Uh, you'll find that on the bottom. Whenever you are prompted to have a question to ask, just fill that in and we will get to it as the conversation progresses. So I want to welcome our panelists. We'll do this in alphabetical order. And we'll start with Stephanie Blake. Stephanie has 20 years of experience in strategic communications and public relations practice. Her company, Blake Communications, is focused on clients creating unique experiences that enhance communities. They include the Cherry Creek North Business Improvement District, Rocky Mountain Public Media, the Denver Theater District, Denver Architecture Foundation, and several clients in the arts and culture sector. Prior to launching Blake Communications, she was an assistant professor of communication at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, where she developed a strategic communication program for the department and taught courses in public relations and mass communication. She received her PhD in mass communication from the University of Minnesota School of Journalism and Mass Communication. He, she's held numerous professional community and academic leadership positions, including chair of the mayoral appointed Denver Commission on Cultural Affairs. Hello and welcome, Stephanie. Thank you, Mike. I'm happy to be here today. Hi, everybody. Hi, and we're gonna do one icebreaker question just to get warmed up. Um, after I introduce you. Uh, what is one memorable experience you've had working with an architect? So I actually go back to my first experience, not necessarily working with an architect, but my parents had an architect who came to the house and I was probably about, gosh, I don't know, 10 um, to re help with the design. They were redoing their kitchen and actually interacting with that architect made me want to be an architect for a period of time. So it was something I considered when I was young. Um, so it's kind of a fun memory. Nice. Well, thanks again, Stephanie, for being here. Our next panelist is Maggie Bolden. Maggie is the Director of Client Relations for Palace Construction. She served as the Society of Marketing for, for Professional Services past president for Colorado, and in 2014 was named as SMPS Business Developer of the Year. Maggie's been focused on sales and business development for more than 25 years. She currently serves on the board of directors of the Workforce Development Board for the City and County of Denver, also Hope Communities and Contractor Academy. Maggie is the co-founder of Business Development Roundtable. She and her business partner teach business development, strategic planning, or I'm sorry, strategic networking classes for Mikasa Resource Center. Welcome, Maggie. Thank you. Nice to be here. And what's one memorable experience you've had working with an architect? Well, I've actually had many, but the one that's probably the most appropriate to share um, is um, I think the one experience that stands out the most is the time that an architect, not being a technical person, but um, the architect took time out of their day to really help me understand the perspective of what it takes to be an architect. So really mentoring me and I really appreciated that. Good. Learn something new every day, right? Yep. Well, thank you, Maggie. Next, we have Nicole Marshall. Nicole is a Salt Lake City-based communications consultant specializing in the built environment with clients based across the country in Colorado, Chicago, San Francisco, and New Orleans, to name a few. Her work focuses on the establishment and enhancement of integrated public relations and marketing programs for small and mid-sized design firms, developers, construction firms, engineering companies, and more. Nicole focuses on helping our clients tell their stories through the most creative lens while helping clients pivot to evolve with the times. Before launching her own independent practice in 2016, Nicole is an account manager for a PR agency, Development Counselors International, which was based in Denver. While there, she specialized in national economic development, media relations, and marketing, earning editorial coverage in some of the nation's top media outlets, such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and more. Welcome, Nicole. Hi. Thanks for having me, Mike. Glad to be here. All right, what's a memory you got for us? All right, um, well, I've had many. Obviously, I'm, I'm immersed in this industry as well. Um, one, I think one that was kind of profound for me was my first job when I first worked in-house at an architecture firm uh, in my hometown of New Orleans. And we went to a meeting, I was with one of the firm principals and 
meeting was super great. Everybody was fired up about the ideas. There was this great urban design strategy that was going to make a big move for the city. And I remember going back to the office where we were met by the other firm partners who were waiting to make sure that everybody remembered that we're supposed to make money. <laughs> and I think that just continues to be so true of my experiences of working with this industry is we are also, you know, architects are just wonderful people who are trying to do a lot of wonderful things for the communities they serve. And sometimes they struggle with that whole side of, uh, I'm supposed to also make money while doing this. So yeah. um, that's one of the reasons why I still work with architects today. I love, I love that part of all of you guys. <laughs> Oh yeah, we've got a business to run here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Sure. And finally, we have Kathleen Bonatovich. Kathleen has overseen and implemented a broad range of strategic communications engagements and outreach initiatives for complex projects, real estate developments, and large scale government projects. With over 17 years in the communications and marketing field, Kathleen bring, brings a diverse background and a multidisciplinary skill set to her clients. As a former communications director, business manager, land development manager, asset manager, even recreation manager. You got a lot of managers in that title there. Uh, Kathleen has held highly visible public facing positions for public and private enterprises. Her programs and clients are national award winners for communications and outreach. She is principal of Project Resource Studio, a strategic communications and marketing firm founded in 2013 to tackle complex project communications, which is based in Carbondale, Colorado. Welcome Kathleen. Hi, thank you. I'm really excited to be here today. So um, I have the pleasure of sleeping with an architect. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm married to an architect um, and it is- uh, Just one memory. Yeah. <laughs> very much part of, of, of our everyday life and in and, and design as well. And, but I think um, what I, when I first start, started dating my husband, he was going through the testing, the rigorous testing to be a licensed architect. And um, I, I got to, you know, give him do flashcards and, you know, create time for him to study. And so I think I really appreciate the discipline and what it, what it takes for architects to um, get that accreditation and all the, the rigorous schooling. I, in our, underneath our house in our basement, we have these models and uh, portfolio, old portfolios and things that are um, quite technical. And um, I, I appreciate that side of, of what, what you do. And um, I just, I also have just a great passion for design. Well, thank you as well for being here and best of luck to your husband. <laughs> we uh, have, of course, to build on that point, the ability to translate what architects do in a technical field to a wider public and client market as well. So that's really the focus today. And I know the temptation is when, when things get a little bit unpredictable or maybe the finances are a bit shaky, um, it's, it's as important now as ever uh, to Nicole's point to make sure we have a business to, to stay open. Uh, to try and figure out what is essential versus non-essential. And I think in a time like this, your, your marketing presence is as important as ever, um, not only to make sure you keep your current clients, but to make sure that new business comes in the door. So um, that is the reason why um, some of our member leaders have suggested this would be a relevant topic that our members wanna hear about from firms across the state and why we are happy to do it today. So we're gonna start with some questions that we've um, shared amongst ourselves in advance uh, while we get the rest of the attendees um, queued up with some questions that we want to get to as well. So I'll start with uh, Stephanie and Maggie on this question. And it's just um, probably what's on most people's minds right now. Is it, is, is it different? Does marketing during a pandemic look any different from typical marketing? And if it does, how is it changing? Stephanie, do you want to start? I can start if you want me to. Sure. Um, thanks, Maggie. So, you know, I think a few things. I think um, one of the trickiest things, and I'll obviously be speaking from the public relations point of view because I do that more than I do marketing, but they go together hand in hand. Um, but I think the the planning is the most challenging because I think, you know, we all had these great plans um, for 2020 and what it looked like in terms of our marketing. And we're finding that we, we have to, tweak those plans almost sometimes on a weekly basis um, based on what's happening. So not only the pandemic, but also the Black Lives Matter movement um, really has 
changed the timing of how we can release information because we have to be sensitive to the issues that are going on. So I think that timing piece is one way that it's shifted. Um, I'll just say two more quick things and turn it over to Maggie. Um, from the PR side of things, it's always been important that we watch the news cycle to see what media are covering, when they're covering it, what topics are important, um, where there might be a place for an unusual topic. And right now that's more important than ever. Um, and that really goes along with my third point, which is that uh, media organizations are also businesses. So they're suffering from the same issues that a lot of businesses are. Um, these numbers are back from April, but you know the Denver Post laid off 13 employees, which greatly affects their ability to cover news. And if you follow the Post, they've been laying, unfortunately, laying employees off for a number of years, but that was a, a big hit to the newspaper. Um, and 28,000 workers of news companies were, e were either laid off or furloughed. So it just really requires um, to get even more um, pointed with your message with media and really, really to pay attention to the timing. Um, so I'll add to that, um, my responsibility is really bringing in opportunities. And that has been a complete shift. Not only did our marketing budget pretty much come to a standstill, we had to really think about how were we going to start reaching out to people. There's always email, that's one thing, but you have to really think outside the box and try to figure out, okay, so who are the, the top clients, who are the top prospects that I really want to reach out to and stay in front of, and then how can I leverage really my connections and help either the prospects or the clients. And for me, it's always really been about the partnership and being able to give to others because I believe it, it comes around in the long run. Um, but really listening to the client or the prospect and understanding where they are, how has all of this impacted their business and what are they seeing um, in terms of the market cycle? Mm -hmm. One thing that um, you said, Stephanie, in your answer would probably help the people who aren't in the business to understand. Um, you said, I'll, I'll answer it from this perspective. Um, for non-practitioners who are in a totally different field altogether. Um, they tend to lump everything into communications or marketing, but there are subsets and specialties, right? So could, could you guys help unpack a little bit what's the difference between say marketing versus communications versus PR versus uh, business development? Um, they're, they're all a little bit different. They're all tools in the toolbox. Um, but for people that are only on the um, either receiving end of that or occasionally consumers of those services, how would you differentiate them and explain what each of those are? Um, I can pipe in if, 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 um, if that would be helpful. I know you, um, so I guess just to best all of those tools, I mean, that some firms, I've, I work with a lot of firms now as my own consultant and some firms like some of those words and other firms like other of words of others of those words. I think what's important to remember is that all of it is with the goal of sustaining and or growing your firm, right? So these are all different aspects of how we can help um, in that mission. And so typically I personally use kind of business development as the bigger umbrella. Um, and then you have marketing tools to help get there. You have PR and communications tools to help get there. And you have networking and strategic relationship work that all kind of serve that bigger goal of business development. Um, but PR, just for the difference too, the PR marketing difference, um, I think PR is best described as kind of, um, it's the agenda of kind of reaching your audiences. And when you reach those audiences, what are you saying to them? What are they learning about you? Versus marketing is kind of more of the, the process of awareness um, and awareness creation and staying in top of mind um, in, in front of them in some level. It's funny, I mean, I'm looking at a bunch of wonderful marketers and PR people here. I'm sure I'm butchering this, but I think that's kind of a little bit of a way to, to distinguish the two. Ultimately, I think firms, firms sometimes need PR a little bit more than they need marketing and sometimes they're, they're better at one or the other. But ultimately, in the best case scenario, those things should be integrated and those things should be supporting one another. Um, as well as the efforts of the business developer, like Maggie is the relationship maker and, and the work, the work capturer. Um, I think that 
PR and marketing need to be supporting that agenda ultimately at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, so, Nicole, that's, that's a good explanation. Um, I'm just gonna jump in with one other, one other tool and that is, and I kind of see this above all, and that's brand, your, your brand, who your brand is, what is it, how does it work and feel? What are those emotions behind your brand? Are you, you know, it makes marketing and PR a lot easier when you have a very strong brand foundation of who you are and why you're doing it. Well, thanks for explaining that a little bit. I know it, it can be confusing to people who, who see all these terms interchangeably and, and are like, well, isn't it all the same? Well, not really. You know, everything has an audience and a purpose and you have to get the right tool and the right expertise for the audience you're trying to reach and the message you're trying to get across. Um, I'm curious what are some, I mean, we're still early in this and we're gonna at the end of the, toward the end of the, our time together, we're gonna share some case studies of what we've seen other clients do. Um, but what are some successful examples of marketing done well um, as people have pivoted in this new world that we're living living in. Nicole or, or uh, Kathleen, you wanna chime in on that? Um, you can go, you, okay, you go ahead, Kathleen. Well, I, I was just gonna say, it, it, timing is everything right now. Um, and is information easy to access? You know, have you, have you, have you updated things? Is it easy to access? Um, and when I, when I think of organizations that like reacted quickly, that was a way to immediately build trust. Trust right now is very, very key because people are not sure. They're not sure. Are they ready? Are they not ready to engage? Or do they want to meet you at a site meeting and, and walk the, the, the project? Uh, it's about trust right now. And so I think that um, timing trust and, and authenticity is where, where, where you've seen the good work being done. And it's really weeded out, in my opinion, um, you know, some of the floozy marketers, I don't know how to, you know, some of the professionals versus non-professionals in terms of communication, um, because it's very easy to see now if you're, if you're being authentic or not. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say something similar to that too, but I, I think one thing that I noticed, especially kind of right in the beginning of, of all of this taking off was to me, it felt really important to remember that our industry as an architecture industry, we were not the worst affected by this pandemic. You know, obviously depending on your firm makeup and the sectors that you serve, you might have varying degrees of that impact. But in general, we're a fairly digitized industry. Um, we operate a lot behind computer screens. So the, the capacity to quickly do that from home instead of a studio was kind of easy on us. Um, so to me, I think your marketing messaging in the beginning really had to kind of recognize that. And I think some firms that did a good job of acknowledging um, that comparatively, we have it pretty good. Um, I think that came across with a good um, perspective. And I think that firms who, uh, who went silent, um, I think that also to your trust point, I think that didn't work out so well. I think that you wanted to be reaching you as you continue sh to be, you should continue to be reaching out to your clients before they're reaching out to you right now um, to show them that you're there, that whether you're physically at one address or another, that you're working on their work um, and that you're ready for more of it, hopefully, um, whenever they have it. Um, and I think that I saw some firms really jump out with some really great problem solving as a way to have that awareness. Um, I think it was Perkins and Will I saw they did quickly, I think it was within a week of everybody getting stay at home orders, they came up with a work from home toolkit that you could print out and uh, cut out and it would help you get ergonomically set up at your desk, you know, things like that. I think it was just the way that people could quickly um, crank out ideas and generate ideas. That was the best marketing because we ultimately are serving, you know, we're a service industry. So serving people with ideas was the best marketing for a while. I think it will continue to be for a long time, but I think now that's a little bit more in balance with we're also a business who's having to figure out how to operate. So that expectation is not quite as strong as it maybe was in that first month to where we were all trying to rush to come up with the, the best new idea to be responsive and to look creative, right? So that was kind of what stood out to me was those cool, the cool creative ideas. I, I do think, it, oh, go ahead. This is a little bit of a sidebar, but I can't help myself from saying it. 
February 23rd, 24th, around that time, I was in Miami at a, a national PR news crisis communicators conference. Fortune 500 companies were there. Not one mention of the coronavirus or how to prepare or mm -hmm. anything. We were just not thinking about it as, as strategic communicators. Yeah. Well, you could make the same argument going back to any day in early to mid, even late May about race and, you know, injustice or police brutality too, right? There was almost nothing being said on a corporate level from companies about that. And now everybody has something to say about it. So yeah, it and, and those who, I think, the important thing to note on that front too has been those who have done that work of to vision themselves and to clarify their message and their voice. Stephanie, I'm sure that you recognize this with your clients. It's like if a client had done that heavy lifting to clarify who they are and understand their identity, responding quickly in that moment of what do we have to say about this issue? Where do we stand on this issue was far easier and far more successful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think any firm that took 10, 10 days, two weeks to be responsive. It was so clear and obvious. I guess as a communicator from my side of the screen, I was saying, well, they spent a lot of time in meetings trying to craft that message, right? Because it wasn't already in their DNA. It wasn't already in their brand and they were having to quickly come up with that. So I think it was a good moment. That particular moment was a really important reminder for firms that if you haven't done that vision work and that mission and that clear identity work, this is when we need to go ahead and learn that lesson the hard way and get it done. And don't ever look back and say, I wish I would have done that when I had the time. And if I could just add to that, because I think that's so true, Nicole, you're spot on with that. I think there's also this importance both with COVID and with Black Lives Matter movement of action, not just words. So I think it's gonna become very clear and evident over time, not just who has been doing this for a while and preparing for it, but also who's putting action behind it. Anyone can write a beautifully crafted messaging statement um, with some work and time, but who's actually putting action behind keeping employees safe, you know, transitioning back to the new normal or next normal. So I think that action piece is absolutely vital. You can't just say you're doing things. You actually have to show through your marketing efforts how you're doing them. And, and you will get called out on it if you're not backing up with action because it's, it's not a matter of putting an ad in the New York Times. Well, let's buy a full page ad in the New York Times and we may never hear from our uh, customer base about it. You know, once it's on Twitter, you'll hear about it. So either you're you're prepared to back it up or you're not. And what's really interesting about this time is we're seeing people both craft, develop, and iterate messaging on an almost daily basis um, to respond to to the times that we're in. So it's got to be fascinating to watch as professionals. It's um, it's a little bit overwhelming to watch as someone um, who's not. And I think. Architects, architects play a, a really unique role right now because you're responsible for the environmental design for how we interact with each other in this new, uh, you know, um, social distancing world. So, you know, I, I, we've seen everything from acrylic screens get put up, put up to, um, you know, stickers on floors and all the different design elements. And um, how, how are you? How are you? communicating and working with your clients on on that design solution too i think is part of your a part of your brand mm -hmm. we had a conversation just yesterday with um several other uh so it was with the ai president ceo of ai and and some other large city um executive directors and it was a check-in you know how are you doing how are you adapting but i think at the end of it we were feeling a little bit overwhelmed and a little bit um like we, we weren't quite sure how long this could last and we could keep doing, operating at the same level. You know, it just seems like it, it never ends, uh, the challenges it faces. But the, the thing that gave us hope was whatever is happening in society, architects can help. So if it's a public health emergency, there's something architects can do to address that. If it's about the design of our communities, um, if it's about making more humane places uh, for people to, um, you know, deal with law enforcement and, and justice, 
they can help with that. So whatever is coming down the road, architects can help. And I think sometimes they don't know how to share that message in a way that's, that's sincere and authentic and that, that doesn't look like they're just trying to get work, right? So that's the trick, isn't it? Um, I want to ask uh, Maggie and Stephanie a question about just internally, you have, you have companies that are in this business versus being um, maybe more of an in-house person. How have you pivoted your company and the efforts that you, you've done? Um, has your business model changed at all or some of the, the things that you've offered and how you package them? Well, I'll just, as a contractor, we've really been in the thick of it because if you can imagine trying to stay six feet apart and try to hang drywall mm. is almost impossible. So it's not only um, that we are having to keep, make sure that our staff is safe, but we are, we are currently working in three occupied senior communities. Mm. So as you can imagine, we have to also make sure that the residents are safe and that the owner of the actual project is comfortable with us being in those spaces. So not only really having to um, come up with immediate protocols of what we're going to be doing, but if we have a COVID outbreak, which we've had, um, getting our uh, sanitation or our decontamination uh, group in there immediately and getting it safe and then making sure it's safe for um, the inspectors, because that's the other piece of this whole equation as well. But for me, it was doing business development. I just, I felt like a fish out of water the first week. And then I immediately just started connecting with people that I've been um, staying in contact with, but also reaching out to people that I have not had contact with in several months. So really um, kind of checking in with the weak ties, if you will, and uh, shoring up those relationships and finding out how I can introduce them to maybe some of the clients that we work with. So that's kind of how we've been doing things. And how did you sort of triage that list of your contacts from, you know, who this is, I got to reach these groups of people first and then second, third, et cetera. Right. Um, great question. So it was with, any current project that we've got going on immediately, uh, reaching out to the architect and to the engineer, finding out how things are going, and also then any upcoming projects that we've got in the pipeline, checking in with all of them. And then third was really understanding um, what markets are going to be hopefully um, getting more work in the future and reaching out to developers, architects that, um, we do a lot of affordable housing. So I could already have a list of people who had submitted their tax credit application. So immediately that was a great resource um, for me to check in with. And Stephanie, how about as someone who's, who's got a business that, that is navigating these waters, how have you had to pivot? Yeah, so I think probably like everyone on this call can probably relate to this at some level. The first couple weeks were just insane because everyone, you know, to Kathleen's point, people weren't even thinking about this. It wasn't on anyone's radar. So I think everyone just went into sort of panic mode initially. And, you know, when you're helping with people with PR, you don't want a bunch of panicked people. That's the last thing you want. So I, you know, was sort of just trying to figure out how I could best serve my clients and help lead them through this stage of panic into what's going to happen next. Um, so there was that in the beginning, a lot of just figuring out messaging as we were talking about, figuring out what to say and when to say it. We do a lot of event promotion. And as you can imagine, it's particularly heavy during the summer. And so a lot of our clients were just kind of sitting and waiting um, to see whether these events were going to be canceled. And, you know, I 
sort of could see the writing on the wall that given what was happening, you know, an event with 350,000 people, even if you tried to pull it off, nobody was probably going to show up to it. So um, then we were helping clients with cancellation messages, also helping them look at, you know, what are creative ways you can pivot or do other things um, to try to still continue to use your resources and, and interface with the community during this time. Um, for me personally, I'll be in business 10 years next year. So probably for the last two years or so, I've been thinking about what the next iteration of my business looks like. Um, I have a young daughter. My summers are crazy. This is the first non-crazy summer I've had. Um, you know, it's crazy in different ways, but um, not, not as, as um, busy in terms of work. So I'm using it as an opportunity to think about, you know, kind of like Maggie said, she's reaching out to, to contacts to touch base with them. I'm really trying to think of um, putting in place what's next um, and how that can serve people moving forward because I do think um, some things will return to the way they were before but I really think this is giving people a different perspective and outlook and they're the way they view um, the stories they tell and how they tell them and who they tell them to I think is going to shift in some ways so I'm looking at how can I you know keep my business at the forefront of that. I'm curious if if there are people thinking about, so you're thinking of the next iteration of, of the services that might be demanded in your marketplace, but what about a, an architecture firm, for example, that wants to get into a new market? Is, is this a time to do that? It might be by necessity or it might be something that was in their strategic plan even before this happened. Um, should I they think it's a perfect put the time. brakes on that? Yeah, I think it's a perfect time to explore your strengths and to lean into that now and, and determine, is there something you've been thinking about doing but have it done because you've been too busy? At our office, we have it called rainy day projects list. And it's all things that we wish we could do if we weren't so busy. And so um, I think I would encourage the, the architecture firms to, to think innovatively right now. Why not? We, you, you have nothing to lose by doing that. Um, and kind of workshop those strengths and ideas and um, you know something really really creative might come out of that yeah Mike I would add to that too um, I think one of the things I had noted was that this is a great chance our industry I feel for the last several years has been inching towards this idea of breaking out of the sector portfolios and starting to move into well what do we really do what do we how do we serve our clients how do we solve problems for them and most of our storytelling is moving in that direction and I think now is a great time to be clarifying your, your problem solving. So what are, the, what are the categories of problems that you're solving for clients instead of what sectors do you work in? Yeah. And then how might that be applied to a new sector or to a new geographic marketplace? Because it's a problem that suddenly, maybe it doesn't exist in this city anymore, but it now exists in that city. Or it's a problem that was in this industry and now it's a new problem for a new industry. So I think I've been encouraging clients to use this time to break down our those walls and those kind of that that barrier thinking that we've had in this industry for so many years and trying to step into the idea of thinking like a client servant thinking of that thinking in that way of of how are we what do we do creatively not just how many square feet of school buildings do i have so i think that is that that lends itself towards looking at other sectors for for in a new way than maybe people have been thinking about in prior years or, or even thinking of new ways to serve the people you're already working with. Mm -hmm. yeah. I and, and I would say, don't shy away from that in, in the RFP process too. Mm -hmm. That would be a good um, format to, to differentiate yourself for, for new business. Yeah. I don't know if this is still true, but it was said to me early on that um, the, the hierarchy of, of things of, for firms to market in terms of ease and success rate the easiest is an existing product to an existing client, mm -hmm. uh, followed by a new product to an existing client, because you've already got a relationship, uh, hopefully a good one, uh, followed by an existing product to a new client. And then last is a new product to a new client. You know, mm -hmm. that's the hardest. So it's not as if you're just locked into option one. We can only sell to the, the market we have with the things we are doing today. Um, there are ways to break out of that, uh, but you don't want to go all the way to the end of that progression and say, what are all the new things we're going to do and the new clients we're going to get because of that? 
you got to build your way to that that mm -hmm. end game. And certainly we've all been pivoting, I think, and, and creating new services, right? I mean, now, now we're all designing barriers or we're designing signage um, for six feet apart. You know, I think most of, our, most of our firms have had that opportunity with their current clients and, okay, well, we've tried that out for a few months. Do we like it? Do we want to go into the environmental graphics space or do we want to start helping with space planning for times of crisis, you know, and how do we package that and sell that service as well? So... I think we've all been forced a little bit into new service lines that we that we might not have ever envisioned going into. And now we have to take that moment of saying if it's a keeper or not. <laughs> yeah, Nicole, on that point, um, you know, the restaurant client group has been uh, uh, a prime example of that. You know, their revenues are down. Um, they're not going to make physical improvements that wouldn't, you would normally think, oh, I need to hire an architect to build an addition or revamp the kitchen or do a new restaurant, that's not gonna happen. But architects are really good at space planning. They already have the plans for their clients of the restaurants. And so they can reconfigure in a way that meets these new public health guidelines. So um, it's, a, it's an existing client with a bit of a new service. So I think there are gonna be opportunities for that um, as long as we're dealing with restrictions on how we move and use space um, in every kind of client sector. I'm, one thing I've seen, and I want to talk a little bit more into, into some detail on, on specific um, platforms. So I had seen early on that the, and we had this experience too at AI, our open rates went way up. So people were hungry for information. So we're, we were at a certain rate before where people are just too busy and they're like, you know, I'll get to that later. Um, so low click throughs, low open rates. Um, there was a big spike. And then I think, people respond to that, they're like, oh, people want more information, so let's send them more information. So now the volume that's being communicated is through the roof, and are, are people just starting to tune that out? I, I'm exhausted by it, and I'm a communications professional. <laughs> I'm utterly exhausted by it. What, what has differentiated what I have seen is that personal phone call going to what Maggie said picking up the phone, what can I do to be a problem solver today? And there's only so many emails you can send out. I, it, it, people are just deleting at this point. Um, so we'd love to hear what you guys have to say, but, but I'm exhausted by the saturation of information. Um, and I think you know that, that personal side of it is, is really important right now. I think that's also where the, the concept of push-pull marketing, you know, really comes in handy in terms of, you know, there needs to be some action, right, of, of communicating with people. They may choose not to read it, but making sure it's on your website and on social media. So if people are thinking, oh, I wonder what, you know, that firm is doing about this, or I wonder what that product or service, how they're handling this situation. They can go to your website or go to your social media and you haven't just remained silent. So I think that's a way to make sure that you're, you're still um, being active, but um, if people seek you out, you'll have that information there. So I think that's a really important piece of it. And I would just also add, I know I shouldn't say this while well, we're all sitting on a virtual event, but I think there also were a ton of virtual events that came out, right, in response. And so I've seen some people do some really creative things to try to, um, and there's definitely a place for virtual events, but to supplement that with some other ideas. So thinking about if you have an event and you know you can't have, you know, um, thousands of people come to it. We had a client, K Contemporary, which is a gallery in town. They actually put art on a billboard truck and drove it around town. So not only did that, um, and they didn't, they didn't say it was K Contemporary, it was very small. So it was really more about bringing art to people where they are instead of, you know, it's, it's really hard if you're on a computer screen, um, art is not the same, you can't experience it the same way. So it also gave access to a whole new audience of people around um, what they do in their art. So I thought that was such a cool way of, and obviously it costs money, um, but you know, thinking of architecture is so visual. Are there ways that you can be getting um, in front of people where they are in socially distanced ways that are outside of the virtual event platform? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just, I will mention this because there was an architect that um, 
recently, I think they are on their third virtual panel. So they convened a panel of experts. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they used that as a marketing tool to reach out to either existing clients or clients that they want to get in front of or prospects rather. So that has been really successful in terms of that. And some of the senior living communities, um, some of them are holding a drive-through snow cone um, networking event as a way just to let the public know it's okay, you know, we're still here um, because that industry has really been hit hard by uh, COVID. So I think there are a lot of really creative ways. Um, I did want to add a comment about going into a new market. I do think it's really important to figure out um, your research first and to really understand who's already in that market as it is and what's, what are, what's the likelihood that there's going to be more opportunity coming uh, from that market. I think that's really important. Um, but to your point about responding to RFPs, it's great to respond to them if you think you have a shot at it, but it's a lot of time and money involved in doing that. So we've really tried to be very selective about what RFPs we respond to. So. And everybody's got that, that arrow in their quiver too. So we, you might have normally had six firms respond to an RFP and now that's 26 firms. So um, you, you really need to think about the time you're going to invest in that and make sure it's worthwhile because your odds might have decreased as well. I want to go um, back to one, one thing that Nicole said earlier. Um, this is such a good time to sort of dig in deep to their mission and values of your organization because the, we're, we're going to be in crisis, I think, for a while now. Um, and we don't know what else is going to. So we're going to be in this marketing challenge, I think, going forward. And um, if you haven't done the hard work, I think that's, that's the first place to start. That's an internal message too. I mean, we focused a lot on the client and the external message uh, for most of this conversation, but that, that branding work only has success if it's imbued in the culture of your organization and everybody who works with it. So yeah. that, that yeah, reflection absolutely. isn't just, okay, how can we reposition ourselves in the market? It's, how do we want to exist as a as an enterprise that employs people and utilizes that talent? I had a good little story of um, a, an architecture firm that I've been working with for a few years now. Um, we finished their first ever strategic plan. It was kind of a 15 year old firm, and they had never really done that work of crafting that vision and the values and and the organizational direction. We finished it just before COVID uh, kind of hit. And one thing they did about a month in is they mailed it out with a personal handwritten letter to every one of their staff members at home. They mailed out a printed bound copy of it as a way to kind of help keep that glue together of we've done this hard work. Let's, let's remember what we're working towards. We're all on this path together. Um, and it really, I, I can't tell you how many positive notes they got back and how many, how, how the team just felt a sense of kind of a, a hug, you know, even if it's just through the mail, it was some, it was a way to feel like they were on a mission together, even if they had to do it from home in their pajamas, you know. <laughs> well, let's, um, we've got some case studies that I'd love to share with the um, audience right now. So Kathleen is the, um, is the master sharer of that PowerPoint. So um, if you wouldn't mind bringing those up now for people to look at. And this is under the, uh, under the guise of, you know, what are we seeing that's working um, or that has gotten a positive response when, when these professionals who are in this business see a message and say, that's clever, that works for me, um, then it's something that we need to pay attention to also. On mute. All right, I'm going to go to share screen. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Um, so this was the first day of uh, Takeout Tuesday in our little town in Carbondale. I got this message on my bag. You can't change the world, but you cannot be a dick and that will help. <laughs> So I think that a little bit of, um, you know, not being, being sensitive during this time has been an important message. 
I really like um, Olive Garden and it's not a restaurant that I frequent, but I love how they reframed what you can expect from us, not what we've done or how we're doing it, but expectations, reframing your marketing in terms of expectations to the client. This hospitality project, Gateway Canyons, stay safe, start living. And it's a little bit, that's where you would go to get their COVID information, but it's a welcoming node to safety and the kind of what's next now. We're gonna position, re, now the messaging is kind of moving toward safety and interacting in environments now. Um, Old Navy and their $30 million of clothing to family in need. I think the philanthropic organizations that have stepped up during this time are really have been positive. Um, I got a credit on my ski pass from Aspen Skiing Company. Um, you know, we realize you didn't get to finish your, your, um, your ski season. So here you go. Um, here is your, your refund. And that's something that we did for our clients too. We gave 10% um, off our fees um, for the, the two months during the COVID. Uh, this is a commercial developer client with that, that we've been working with. In the middle of entitlements, preliminary plan, um, $200 million project in Snowmass Village, very high risk, high stakes. We had a really good outreach plan going and then COVID happened. So we had immediately adjust our information to communication on essential services and how to access that, that um, uh, development. This is a nonprofit organization here. They're in the middle of building a theater. They had a huge campaign going, um, or we're getting ready to launch a massive fundraising campaign. Of course that didn't happen, but in five minutes, they sold out from a uh, Crown Mountain Park, a movie in the park where you drive in and watch the movie. Not part of their organizational uh, mission, but they, they tried something new and, and it worked. This is a development project we're working on, Aspen Pedestrian Mall, it's a redevelopment project. It was one of the projects that was a, a deemed essential service, so sort of sensitive. Some other projects got canceled and then this project moved forward. It was very important for us to stay sensitive to that, acknowledging COVID and all of our messaging. Um, Airbnb, they've, they've, they're offering stays for frontline responders. I think this is a good example of connecting your core mission and brand with, with problem solving during COVID. But what I really will remember is, you know, the calls from, from people, um, old text, me you know, text messages, um, how are you hanging in, you know, the person that pro processed those pay tech protection loans, um, unexpected calls. I think in terms of all the branding work, at the end of the day, the, the personal relationships uh, are what, what people will remember. Does the panel have any other examples? That was just a kind of a kind of a high level couple ideas that I've seen. I think there's been um, a lot of others as well. I think access to information. Uh, I, I just the AIA website is great. It's very clear that there's you know, your, your access to the information, your messaging is very easy to find. I think that's important for where we are now too. I really think it's the things that resonate with me are, are personal. And I don't, I guess that's true all the time, but it really seems to be more true now is, is when you were saying Kathleen, an unexpected call from a friend or someone just checking in. Um, they don't have to do that. They've got a hundred other things they could be doing. So it's just nice to be thought of and um, even though in our business people are buying architecture almost as a as a service or a commodity, you know they they need a building permit, and only a sealed set of plans will get them that building permit, so they can have their building. But there's so many people they could get that talent from. So at the end of the process, they've decided to work with a person um, or a or a team of people, not necessarily. Um, uh, a, a software program. So it, it is the personal stuff that cuts through the clutter. And I would say it's not too late. Also, if you if you've done nothing during this crisis, maybe have a team huddle and 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 figure out what resonates with you. What, where can you show up during this crisis as an organiz as a as a business? I think there's there's still opportunity, and it's and 
important. I think the tone too also has to match your brand. So the first slide you showed about um, basically an irreverent message, you know, that acknowledges the circumstance we're in, but doesn't try and, you know, they're, they're not in the business of issuing health guidelines. They're, they're serving food. So um, they can, you know, use humor and, and I, I think you have to match your message with the brand and the kind of, um, kind of work that you're in. But I also think it's true that you can't, I, I've noticed with social media that some people seem kind of oblivious to what's happening in the world. So um, it's really not the best idea to show that you're enjoying happy hour when someone in another city has been shot and there's a riot, you know, uh, in your same town. That kind of is going to make me think twice about you as a business person or somebody as a partner I'd like to team up with on a project, right? So it's not just timing, you know, you have to take advantage of things when they're relevant. It's also, are you, are you setting the right tone with what you're putting out in the world? I think one of the, that's a good point, Mike. I think one of the things we've seen through this process has been this idea that there are periods for where it's appropriate to be visible and there's a periods where it's not. And I think in those several weeks after the pandemic, us talking about our great new project that we got or talking about these great photos we just got in was pretty disrespectful. So suddenly as marketers or as people who are firm owners who are very nervous about looking quiet, um, I was really trying to advise clients and still continue to through the Black Lives Matter movement, take those weeks and let's focus on these internal things or these things behind the scenes. Um, I had one client, for instance, where we were doing a bunch of media relations work at the time. And I said, well, we're not going to get the press's attention during a, the onslaught of a pandemic. So let's put this on pause and let's work on the website, say, because the website is something that we know we need to have a better face on. And we've been putting off that project. Um, so there's so much that you can do behind the scenes during those quiet weeks. Uh, and, and kind of that strategic voice work, identifying kind of maybe what is your social media plan moving forward or working on your website or working on your LinkedIn page, whatever it might be. I think there's a lot of things that people need to learn that it's not that I'm not marketing or it's not that I'm not working on my brand. It's that I'm going to do the quiet stuff for right now and be respectful of what's going on in the world before I come back out to say, you know, look at, look at my fun little happy hour, you know, the next week. And it's, I think people are still struggling with that right now. I think we're all struggling personally and professionally. Is it appropriate to be talking about business? Is it appropriate to be talking about our careers or our work when we're still feeling like the world wants us to be talking about something else? Um, and I think that if we can, if we can be careful and respectful, yes, but I definitely still think we're in a little bit of a volume down period of kind of, turn it down a little bit, focus on that stuff behind the scenes and be ready to have smart messaging, creative ideas once it does make sense to kind of slowly turn that volume back up, but also make sure that it's, as we talked about on relevant things, you know, that, that showing action, showing things that matter to the world and that will continue to matter to the world for the next year at least, um, that we should be showing activities or things that we're doing to change our culture on issues of health and safety and on issues of uh, inclusiveness. I think those will be topics that we should be solving for a long time mm -hmm. uh, and including in that messaging. Mm -hmm. Knowing what to say when and why you're saying it is, is um, important right now. And you know, saying nothing is okay sometimes too. Mm -hmm. um, Something I would just add to the social media side of it too. Um, if you're, you know, sharing national campaigns or things that are being done, just really making sure you're going to the source of where those campaigns are coming from. I mean, with the Blackout Tuesday um, that happened, gosh, was that two weeks ago now? You know, a lot of the Black Lives Matter leaders were not all for that movement. And so a lot of organizations that reposted that got some some um, angry people responding. Um, and, you know, right now, a lot of you're going to get opinions regardless. That's how social media works. We're really encouraging clients to make sure they have social media guidelines in place so you have clear ways of responding to these things, but just also making sure you're really going to the source of anything you're sharing on social media and really making sure that your mission and culture is aligned with the mission and culture of that statement or movement or whatever. Because I just think you're trying to do something positive and the intentions are good, but it can backfire. So being really careful on that is important. Yeah. Yeah. I would just make one point. comment in 
we are involved in several nonprofits. And I think it's also trying to understand how are those nonprofits coping because they've really been impacted. You know, I'm on the board of Hope Community, so they've been impacted greatly. How can we help support them? And um, in the early days, we did have our uh, N95 masks um, donated to uh, Lakewood so that the first responders would have um, masks so that they could go out there and do their job. But I think it's really, uh, several of you pointed to this about staying true to your brand, staying true to your culture and your values is really important. So we had a question from an audience member. Beth asks, um, I've been invited by a realtor to do short marketing videos describing architecture. What would you emph emphasize? So it's a real estate client and the real estate client wants the architect to, to add some value to their marketing. Yes, let's go with that. I, I assume so. <laughs> I don't think they're just wanting to um, do public service announcements on architecture. I mean, generally, I think that sounds like a good idea. I think it just, you know, to approach it with some sensitivity and some um, awareness and, uh, and timing. Yeah, I would also add, obviously, I wouldn't do that effort if you're not in the single family residential space. So make sure that that's ultimately an audience you're also trying to reach. Um, maybe you could break down your ideas um, by room. Maybe you could break it down by common spaces of a home. I think you could do a series that would be helpful to kind of provide that architect's perspective to a homeowner, because a lot of times they don't get that. They just, they might get a renovator's perspective, a contractor's perspective. They don't often get an architect. Those of us who have architecture friends luckily do, but um, I think kind of just providing perspective on, on the bigger ideas about common trends and spaces and stuff. I think um, if that's your audience, then absolutely gra gravitate towards that and, um, and then reshare that content too for, for your own channels too. Yeah, I think if it's commercial development or retail or hospitality right now, that, that's, that's a little bit more of a, a gray area. Okay. I'm going to put something in the chat. Our, our national office has developed uh, what's called a message book. And I think the key takeaway there is to, to make it accessible. Um, architects do have a lot of knowledge and a lot of um, technical expertise and insight. Sometimes it can get a little jargony, um, the way we describe and talk about uh, what architecture is and what design is. So um, if you got a general audience that's in the public, they're not gonna know some of those terms and it might, um, help, mm -hmm. might not help you get the message across. Sure. I think to that point too, I just wanna add about video. Um, right now, especially, I think, think one thing I'm seeing with a lot of my architecture clients is that we're gonna have a photography problem for the next foreseeable future. Um, a lot of our spaces have not been able to be documented or our clients are slow to let us do that. Um, if the buildings are commercial or spaces where you can go visit or even from the sidewalk um, and public realm, go shoot your own video, go shoot some casual photos, You know, try to be a little bit of an iPhone photographer um, so you don't regret missing this period because it's probably not gonna go away very soon. The photographers I'm talking to now you know, they can't even commit to a shoot until probably October, November. And for Colorado, that's a big deal because we're missing our prime summer months um, for shooting. So I've seen some great stuff where people are doing Instagram stories, where they're doing a walkthrough of their own project and showing off their project um, in kind of a more casual social media way as well. Um, so just try to think creatively about how you can capture stuff in a way that's obviously not going against your client's rules. If they're open to the public and you are the public, you can do that. But um, uh, just make sure that you're on top of that now, even though the, the world is fighting against us documenting these beautiful projects. <laughs> well, I want to close with um, any advice you would have for, I mean, so kind of like, you, you've had a lot of specific advice and great answers to the question. It's been a terrific conversation. And I thank you for, for contributing to its quality. But any parting words you might have for our architect uh, listeners today, um, just 
And it goes back to, Nicole, your attempt to summarize all the various subsets of this field. Um, you know, that is the, the closing thought is keeping and growing your business right now. Um, what would you tell them they need to do? Um, either tell the, the professionals they're working with from the marketing standpoint, um, this is what I, this is what I want to put out into the world about our company right now and our employees, or if they don't have that expertise, what they can do themselves. So um, whoever would like to start with that, I think we may have lost um, one of our panelists. If she comes back, I'll be sure to get Maggie on that conversation too. So parting thought. I think, I mean, my parting thoughts, I think of already been said, but I would just stress them. Um, I feel like now is a really important time to be listening. I think we sometimes forget as communicators, it's not just what we say, it's also taking in information and listening, um, whether that's picking up the phone call and talk, phone and talking to people through a phone call or whether that's, you know, reading every day to make sure you're aware of what's going on. And then I think along with that, it's really thinking about and listening helps with this, but you know, who do you serve and what do they need? Because I think um, it goes back to the same old tenets of marketing, which is who is your audience and where are they in this space right now? Understanding that, I think if you're able to do that, um, those two things I think go a long way right now. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly, Stephanie. Mm -hmm of good things that have been said on the panel here. Um, I would just add, um, you know, th think of it as an integrated approach to whether it be marketing, public relations, your website, your RFP process, your photography, your social, um, an, an integrated approach. Um, yeah, I would also add just, um, I think one thing we haven't talked too much about today, but the, the idea and this, this industry has a terrible term for it, thought leadership. Right now is a great time to be putting out your ideas, to be documenting your ideas, whether it's in a video or in writing, um, whether it's sharing it with the press or putting it on your website or on your social media. Um, there's a lot of great tools out there you can use as well. But I think I'm, I'm watching um, the time slip by and thinking that we have so many great ideas in this industry that are not being shared uh, because people don't know where to take them. Um, and I think that as designers, we do have incredible ideas um, in this industry. So teach yourself to write, do the effort, sit down, teach your, get your team involved and kind of invest in that idea of, of the, the development of the idea and not just where are we putting it or where is it going, but, but really the thoughtfulness behind the creative solutions that you can offer to the world. Um, and then people like all of us can help you get it out there, but focus on developing those ideas and, and that, that kind of stuff that will pay off. Five years from now, you might have a client who that idea is beneficial to. So solve it later where it goes or how it gets there. Use your time now when we have to be a little quiet to, to think and to get, to get it in writing or get it thought through. Maggie, we're just uh, doing parting thoughts for, for the panel um, before we sign off. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my computer decided to run out of battery juice, but you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I would just say that, you know, don't one, don't be afraid to reach out to people. And um, it might be a little uncomfortable at first, but they do appreciate it. And also use your current connections. In, and I don't mean use in a negative way, but I mean, partner up with people. You have a lot of opportunities to just create something whether it's a dialogue with them or how can you both work together to get an opportunity together. And that's what I've really have found successful is partnering up with the architects that I know and introducing them to developers as I, as I mentioned earlier. So that's it. Well, those are um, great thoughts and some of the things I've taken out of it. Um, and really throughout the conversation, but they've been amplified by your closing thoughts were um, whether it's a phrase of, you know, integrated or, or asking questions, it's really taking stock of, of where you are as a, as a company and a group of people that have a shared mission or how you're responding to things that are happening in society that you may not have had the chance to question before, you know, are, what is our 
process of how are we taking care of people's health? Um, that's something everybody cares about. It's not just sending them at home, but what does it look like when they go and talk to clients and when we do come back to the office? Um, what, what are we doing? Are we, are we helping or hurting this cause of justice in the, in the wider world by how we operate? Um, so that kind of assessment is, is important to ask when, when we have these things bearing down on us. And then um, the big picture conversations, we get so caught up in the project by project or the deadline by deadline progression of things that we don't often ask, what's the theme that runs through all of these? What, what is it that makes clients choose us over all of our competitors that makes us different? And so uh, when you are so busy, you, you lose sight of that. And so you kind of take a step back in times like this to, to say, um, you know, if I look at all the projects we've done and the way we've worked as a team, this is the characteristic that stands out the most. Um, and then of course, the knowing it yourself is not enough. You've got to tell um, the world and the people that you want to target for your messaging, what those themes are. And, and of course that's through people, you know, who do you want to work with? and and cultivate those relationships so all great points um i hope i didn't butcher um what i heard but um it was really uh i i took a lot of positive energy out of this conversation today i hope everybody who's joining us today did as well and i'm, I'm really thankful for your contributions to it so stephanie blake from blake communications maggie bolden from palace construction nicole marshall curated communications and I hope I got this name right, Kathleen Vonatovich from Project Resource Studio. Thank you ladies all very much for sharing with us today. It's most appreciated. Thanks for having us. Thank you. A couple of housekeeping notes before we sign off. Um, you will receive one learning unit from AI for attending today's session. Uh, our future virtual connects, the, the next couple coming up tomorrow, we have a sustainability working group hosting a panel of firm leaders that have committed to the 2030 challenge. So they have uh, made the commitment to have their projects be carbon neutral by the year 2030 and you'll hear how they are progressing on that path and then next Tuesday we have speakers from our our conference of 2019 giving an updated version on their presentation designing places that foster social collision to consider how a global pandemic impacts that goal so same goal different ways of achieving it in today's world Thanks once again for participating as a, as a panelist or attendee. We appreciate it and we wish you well. Have a great week. Thanks. Thank